Okay, um, so the purpose of today's session um, is, you know, just to shed a bit more light on the various checks and balances that exist for some fintechs. Um, so my plan is to take everyone through, you know, what uh, regulatory approvals fintechs might be subject to. You know, we'll go through, you know, those that have to get a license, you know, or seek approval, the approval of a regulator before they can operate in the fintech space. We'll also go through, you know, the very few categories of fintechs that are not subject to regulatory, you know, any regulatory oversight. So if you're a lawyer, my aim is to help you understand what procedures your client may need to go through to maintain their business, you know, and this is outside of core regulations. If you're a budding entrepreneur, it's probably best to, you know, use the session to understand that, you know, accountability is not um, one dimensional. Um, it's not just between you and a regulator. Um, in fact, you know, there are multiple organizations um, in addition to regulators that you, you might be required to report to um, and that you might have to maintain certain internal controls for. So this might lead to you, you know, imposing certain obligations on other partners or on your customers. Like for anyone who was part of the AML um, session with Michael, I'm sure you've seen, you know, just the amount of, um, you know, processes and procedures that have to go into imposing certain things on customers. Um, and it's not fun for fintechs, um, but it is required um, considering, you know, the ecosystem that we're in. Right. So um, for any beginner that is, you know, not fintech savvy um, and, you know, doesn't have, you know, has never read an article about fintech. Uh, essentially, fintech is financial technology. Um, you know, financial technology is the emergence of technology and financial services, um, and it's helping businesses modernize the way they operate. The digital tools, the digital tools being used are changing the way we interface with banks, with merchants, um, our peers. It's making it simpler and faster to carry out transactions. The growth of fintech over the last decade has been so significant that it can't be ignored. Um, and we'll, you know, touch on that um, at the very end of the presentation again. You know, so we've, but we've seen more people turn to online banking, cashless transactions. Um, you can complete your monthly payments at the click of a button. Um, you know, even now we have a simplified bank account that can be opened from an ATM machine. And I think everyone, you know, just managed to take advantage of these tools, especially during the pandemic. Um, it was basically essential. Um, and, you know, all of this is made possible by the parties involved in the ecosystem. So key players in payments today include, you know, a merchant, the acquirer, the issuer, the network and the processor. So the merchant is the business looking to collect payments for their services or, pro or the products that they're selling. The acquirer is the party, usually a bank, that is responsible for collecting the funds um, for a payment once a transaction is successful. Um, and of course, you know, they do it at a small fee. The funds would ordinarily be housed in an acquirer's settlement account until a merchant is settled for the transaction. So in Nigeria, there's usually that T plus one um, settlement period after the transaction occurs. The payment system can be fragmented um, because of various different channels that exist. Um, so acquirers play critical roles in pooling funds um, that are meant to be for merchants and they help them, they basically help pool everything into like one place where, you know, the merchants can trace their payments easily. The issuer is the party responsible for actually marketing and issuing the card product to the customer. So if I have an account with GT Bank and I request for a, a Visa debit card from my account, the issuer in this case is GT Bank. The network is the card network 
that supports the electronic payment system. You know, so some, some very well-known networks are Visa, MasterCard, and American Express. Um, so the processor, um, the roles of the processor and the acquirer can sometimes be you know, um, used synonymously, um, but they're actually distinct roles that can be played by the same party. But essentially a processor acts as a gateway to the payment networks, providing authorization, data, transmission, um, and settlement functions. Um, and you know, they can be an outsourced service to the acquirer. So um, I think one thing that I've learned from being in the FinTech space is that you know, your operations might only be as successful as the partners that you work with. So, you know, all the parties I've mentioned, um, you know, that are involved in the flow of funds for payments, um, you know, they, they have a very crucial role to play. And, you know, if one partner service is unreliable, um, it affects the entire transaction flow. So, you know, we'd, you, you'd want to make sure that you're working with the right people and everyone is, <laughs> everyone is dependable. So fintech in Africa, you know, we've probably all heard and, you know, read about the advantages of having fintech in Africa. Essentially, fintech is helping us build competitive economies and drive financial inclusion. Um, on the topic of, you know, building economies, like it still fascinates me that it's easier and faster to support a business in America or England you know, by ordering things on Amazon or on ASOS, you know, when um, I might not be as confident when it comes to buying items from a neighboring African country. Um, so, you know, FinTech helps us overcome these barriers. And, you know, there's an abundance of talent that's right here at home. Um, and what we're developing is obviously, you know, meeting financial needs. Um, we've seen exponential growth um, for instance, you know, by 2015, mobile money accounts surpassed traditional deposit accounts in 17 sub-Saharan African countries. Um, so we know that there's a significant demand for payment services. So I've pulled up here just some estimated numbers um, that I ran across during my research. Um, the first row is the percentage of individuals using the internet in you know, these four African countries, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa, and Egypt. And you know, these four countries, by the way, um, are meant to be you know, the ones kind of leading innovation on the continent. Um, so they have um, more of like the significant numbers um, that are being monitored. Um, Nigeria should probably, so for the, for the first row, um, let me take it row by row and explain. The first row is the percentage um, of individuals using, um, yeah, using internet. And Nigeria should probably be in the high 50s or low 60s, um, but, you know, based on various, re based on various sources, um, yeah, it came up to about this number. The second row is the percentage of people with an account um, with a financial institution, um, otherwise known as, you know, the banked population. And some CBN figures, um, you know, indicate that this is correct, especially for Nigeria. Sorry, for anyone that's not familiar with the CBN, um, it's the Central Bank of Nigeria, um, the regulating bank in in Nigeria, so I'll be referring to them quite often during um, the presentation. So yeah, that's the CBN. And the third row is the percentage of people that sent or received digital payments in 2019. Um, I suspect the 30% for Nigeria isn't quite right yet. <laughs> it might be higher than this, especially you know, with USSD and um, bank transfers in mind. Um, but I mean, based on all of these numbers, you know, you can, see, you can see from these estimates that there's still untapped potential um, for growth. You know, it's really, it's really South Africa um, that is ahead of the curve 
um, but everyone else, you know, is kind of like, it, it is making, you know, bounds and leaps um, to, to catch up. Um, but yeah, we're going to pick up on why some of, some numbers that are low, you know, such as like the um, banked population, like why, why this is the case um, later on in the presentation. So we're going into various fintech services. Um, the first one, savings and investments. Um, we all know that now is a good time to be saving and making wise investments. Fintechs that offer savings and investments um, products exist to help users reach their savings goals and also guarantee returns. They offer a you know, range of services such as trading securities, advisory services, and portfolio management. Now, um, I'm aware that PiggyVest and CaveryWise are popular platforms in Nigeria. Um, they, you know, they will be required to operate within a certain ambit. Um, so there will be like caps on interest rates and like lending limits, et cetera. Um, most savings platforms can operate with a co-op co certificate of registration. Some people call it a license um, and that's like sufficient for Nigerian standards. Um, in, you know, it's on a state by state basis. and cooperatives. Okay. The next fintech service um, that I'm going to discuss is insurance products. Um, so there are fintechs that offer insurance products. Um, I don't think I know um, I mean, there's a wide range of insurance products, you know, for your car, um, health insurance, life insurance, etc. cetera. Um, I don't think anyone in Nigeria is doing pet insurance yet. Um, something to consider when you're in a better financial position. Um, also, I usually only see Nigerians take out life insurance as part of, you know, a major debt financing. Um, otherwise, it might be seen as um, quite taboo. Um, but, you know, in, insure, techs, in, insure tech companies um, are offering innovative and, you know, very easy to understand and simple services um, that may be more appealing compared to, you know, traditional offerings, especially for the youth. We've seen examples of this in South Africa. Um, you know, they have a company called Pineapple um, that offers peer-to-peer -peer insurance and they also return all unused premiums at the end of each year. Um, in Morocco, uh, they have Daba Doc. Um, it, they offer health insurance um, by providing users with access to nearby doctors, um, hospitals and pharmacies, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, M Pharma um, in Ghana, which provides users with access to pharmacies. Um, so, yeah, at the end of each um, fintech service, I've just kind of dropped a note on the, you know, the regulatory approvals that might be required um, for insurance. Um, it's the national insurance, some, some sort of approval is required from the National Insurance Commission, um, also known as um, NICOM, if you're involved in any, you know, insurance operations. Okay, lending. Um, this is a popular one. So fintech companies offering lending products, um, you know, do so in, a, in more efficient ways compared to traditional banking. You know, you don't need to meet anybody face to face. Um, the company will be able to profile you using data available on social media platforms, you know, for example, um, to assess your credit worthiness. The disbursement and repayment of loans um, is also seen as like much faster and more efficient. And you know, some notable, notable examples um, include like Branch in Nigeria, Getbox in Mozambique, Jumo in South Africa, and Tala 
in Kenya. To operate um, lending services in Nigeria, um, a fintech will either need um, a money lender's license. Um, this is obtained at a state level um, or a finance company license, which is granted by the Central Bank of Nigeria. Um, one of the permissible activities of a finance company is that they're allowed to you know, provide loans um, and earn interest. Um, a microfinance bank license um, is also another option, uh, and that's also granted by the CBN. Remittances. Now, remittances Remittances are, are interesting, <laughs> mainly um, because they're not, you know, standard domestic transfers um, that are only handled locally. Um, fintechs such as Venture Garden or like Sendwave um, help enable, you know, effective cross-border and cross-currency payments. So this is beneficial to a user that needs a quick way to transfer money to friends, to relatives, or you know, just peers that might need, that might need funds um, or foreign currency. It's you know, quite popular with low income workers. Um, you know, they'll, they'll often find informal channels um, more convenient over traditional methods um, so that they can send money home, um, especially when dealing in small amounts. So compared to domestic payments, um, which can be powered by, you know, payment solution service providers, for example, um, remittances carry a much higher burden um, when it comes to documentation. There's also, you know, the issue of currency exchange and the risk of fluctuating rates. So um, this usually adds additional costs for the parties involved in, you know, the flow of funds. Now, fintechs help provide almost instantaneous cross-border transfers at lower costs. So, you know, there's um, online, um, there's like online services such as World Remit. Um, you know, they're operating in several countries um, and they allow transfers um, across borders to be deposited into local banks of the receiver. There's also like Sure Remit in Nigeria, um, you know, which offers tokened non-cash um, remittances. Um, but I'm not, I'm not going to delve um, too much into specific operations. Um, it ultimately, in Nigeria, uh, you need to be licensed by the Central Bank of Nigeria um, to operate as an international money transfer operator. So that's required for um, international remittances. And, you know, of course, if you plan on operating with a foreign IMTO, um, that also requires um, CBN approval as well. Right. Okay, we're going to move on to um, cryptocurrency. Um, crypto is is um, a fintech service I've been monitoring like with bated breath. Um, cryptocurrency platforms offer their customers an opportunity to trade in digital currency. So it's not legal tender and regulators have warned that it should not be recognized as legal tender. You know, but to the extent that, you know, the cryptocurrency is an asset, users are free to trade with it. So not a lot of people understand it, um, but those who do, you know, are using crypto platforms such as Bycoins in Nigeria, and you know they're they're loving the profits. <laughs> um, there's been nothing in writing from the CBN regarding whether they plan to regulate um, cryptocurrency in the future. Sec, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission, however. Um, is expected to develop a framework on categories of cryptocurrency, um, but there's no indication from their 2019 white paper that you know it will be recognized as legal tender. Um, it may, yeah, it may just be um, an asset or a commodity. Yeah. Okay, crowdfunding. 
Um, crowdfunding, you know, goes without saying, it's, it's exactly what it says it is. Um, it's opening up a project to be funded by the public. Uh, we have seen, you know, the growth of crowdfunding platforms in Nigeria, um, particularly agri-tech, um, agricultural technology. Um, some popular platforms include, you know, Kenya's Farm Drive, Nigeria's Farm Crowdy, um, and Rwanda's Twiga Foods. Um, these platforms provide farmers with access to loans, um, crowdfunding, um, or to digital trading platforms and allows them to transact directly with buyers. Um, earlier this year, SEC issued their proposed rules on crowdfunding. Um, Nigeria didn't really have a licensing framework for crowdfunding. Um, so this was a good sneak peek. It was like a good preview of um, what to expect in the near future. According to the rules, any digital commodities investment platform that currently is in operation will need to apply to SEC um, for their no objection once the rules are in effect. Uh, so lawyers, you know, you will all need to monitor um, all the updates from SEC. So, you know, they can, so we can all advise like crowdfunding clients um, when to submit their no objection application um, at the appropriate time. Digital payments. Um, payments is probably the most developed fintech sector. Um, it accounts for about 40% of all fintech products on the continent. It encompasses such a wide range of activities from you know, online retail payments, acquisitions and transfers for merchants, and the provision of the payment infrastructure itself. Some popular payments companies include you know, MTN Momo. Um, they offer digital wallets in Ghana. EcoCash in Zimbabwe, they offer USSD payments. Paystack in Nigeria, they, or should I say we, offer online payments. Um, Zuna in Lesto um, offers payments in the form of vouchers. And of course, you, know, you can see the wide range of licenses available in Nigeria, depending on the nature of the payment service you plan to carry out and the role that you're going to be playing. So I put this digital payment slide um, as the last service because I wanted to explain to lawyers how important it is to understand a fintech business model based on you know like everything that has been captured so far. So I you know would advise you always ask your client um, more questions like honestly as many questions as possible just peel away all of the layers relating to, you know, their service, their product, um, you know, the intention of it. Um, ask yourself, you know, if you really understand their business model. Um, if you don't, continue, just keep asking more questions until you do. Um, figure out if it's purely one kind of service or if it's a hybrid. Um, and also be able to confirm how the flow, like what the flow of funds will look like from end to end. So you'll find it's not always a one size fits all. Um, and it really depends on what each product is offering. You know, for example, you might find an app that offers a lending service on the face of it, but the app might give you the option to hold on to your repayment in the form of a wallet, like in the form of like value sitting in a wallet for you. And then you can spend the money held in the wallet on other services also available on the same app. Now, you know, is that strictly a lending service or are they also providing a wallet service? So, you know, those are the sorts of things you'd want to take into consideration. So I've added this um, pie chart. Um, just to give you an indication of how the various categories of fintech, um, you know, are segmented. And as you can see, the most popular products are in lending and um, the payment space. 
I will also just touch very, very, very briefly on the types of payments that you know we're all familiar with. So mobile money, um, you know, Kenya's and Pesa is one of the best examples of mobile money today. You know, they started off in 2007, I believe, and you know they've grown exponentially since then with legacy platforms, you know, such as M-Pesa. Kenya is one of the economies with the highest use of mobile money. Ghana is now becoming um, one of the fastest growing mobile money markets in Africa, especially during COVID actually. Um, during the pandemic and the lockdown, there was a noticeable increase in mobile money transactions. Um, and that, that was also the case in you know, Kenya and Rwanda. So, I mean, what makes mobile money so popular? Um, you know, the low level um, of financial market infrastructure, such as bank branches, um, automatic teller machines, you know, ATMs, um, and certain payment systems um, can't really fulfill the demand um, for payment services in every market segment. Um, so mobile devices are largely available to everybody. They're easily accessible. Um, so it makes mobile money just an easier and um, more popular option. Um, card payments. There is an end-to-end -end flow <laughs> for card payments that involves all of the parties that um, I spoke very briefly about earlier. And you know, from the um, acquirer to the network to the processor or the switch, um, the um, issuing bank, etc. Um, all of them would be involved in a car in the flow of like in the flow of funds um, for a card payment. So from the moment a customer initiates a transaction um, to make a payment online using their card, this you know, the eight things kind of kick into play. <laughs> and, you know, the, once the transaction is authenticated by the issuing bank um, through the card network and the third party processor, um, the transaction goes through successfully. And the customer will receive value in exchange for their money. Um, and value being, you know, the actual item that they ordered or that they wanted um, to get delivered to them. Um, funds will instantly be deducted from their account um, and then funds would be like to the credit of um, the merchant. So first it would be held by the acquirer in the settlement um, pool account and then and it would flow to the merchant um, in line with you know settlement regulations. <laughs> There's also unstructured supplementary service data, also known as USSD. So if we take um, Paystack's checkout form as an example, um, a bank's, if, a, if a customer decides to use USSD as the preferred payment option, a bank's USSD code will be generated um, through the payment provider and customer will dial the USSD code and follow you know, the instructions in an automated menu to authenticate the transaction. Bank transfers, um, similarly also initiated through the payment provider. Depending on the customer's bank, um, this will lead the customer to their issuing bank um, on the face of the app so that they can complete the transaction you know, by inserting their account number um, and you know, the relevant authentication will be carried out. QR code is a, um, is a relatively new one um, for the African market, um, but it's becoming increasingly popular. Um, I heard that now um, you know, it's like the preferred option for ordering food and you know, for selecting what you want from a menu. Um, and especially during the pandemic, um, you know, you don't have to kind of touch anything you don't want to touch, just scan the code that you want um, for the menu that you want. And you'll be able to complete the payment through the app um, and then you'll follow the instructions that are generated um, on the app. 
Again, once the transaction is authenticated, the issuing bank will deduct funds um, from the customer that initiated the transaction. And then the funds will flow through um, to end up with the acquiring bank in their settlement um, pool account, and then to the merchant that provided the product or the service. Yeah. So at the beginning, of this presentation, um, I mentioned that I wanted everyone, you know, to try and understand how there are levels of accountability in fintech operations. You know, it's not solely one dimensional. It's not just about the license you receive from a regulator. So, you know, now we're moving on to PCI DSS and card scheme rules, um, two topics that will affect any fintech that's processing card payments. So PCI DSS stands for the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. It's a standard that's backed by major card networks such as Visa, MasterCard, Amex, you know, and Discover. Um, PCI DSS is articulated and it's managed by the PCI Security Standards Council. So, you know, they have so many resources on their website to help guide companies on how to become PCI DSS compliant. I would, you know, recommend um, taking a look at what they have online. So the whole idea is that organizations should go through a very detailed audit exercise by a qualified security assessor and you know, become certified as PCI DSS compliant. A company should be able to present two documents as evidence of their compliance. One is the attestation of compliance. This is usually you know, something that if you have it, you can make it available to partners and banks you know, to, show you, to show that you're compliant. The second document is the report on compliance. Um, also known as the rock. <laughs> so the rock is extremely confidential. You know, it's, it's so unless you're a regulator, you probably will not get your hands on the rock for another company. Um, Cause it has, you know, just like the finer details of the audit. So it's important to be PCI DSS compliant because it shows you have proven you have the relevant security controls in place to protect cardholders' data that is being you know, transmitted through your system. So bad actors exploit vulnerabilities in the payments ecosystem to the tune of $11 billion um, in card fraud losses on an annual basis. So the risk is pretty significant. You know, to help prevent security vulnerabilities, service providers in the ecosystem are expected to put certain measures in place to show you know, that they are capable of handling, storing, or transmitting cardholders' data. So all regulators would expect this of a financial service provider, if you know, they're a serious contender, of course. <laughs> so this slide is just to explain the graphics um, and, you know, yeah, just to help you understand when you need to be um, PCI DSS compliant. So if you are storing, transmitting, um, or processing any of the card details that are listed here, then the relevant security measures need to be put in place to protect the data from loss, you know, damage or theft, um, et cetera. So this is a, so this case of you know, PCI DSS compliance isn't just for the financial service provider. Um, so I hope this doesn't get um, too confusing, but if you are a financial service provider and you have a merchant um, that wants to use you, your services um, to collect payments, sometimes you know, they might ask um, for um, access to your charge endpoint. Um, so what this means is, you know, they could have, they, they have the ability to store, transmit, um, or handle like cardholders data. So 
if you're a financial service provider and your merchant asks you, um, if, if they specifically request, you know, for access to cardholders data um, as part of the checkout form or as part of the payment process, you know, you definitely want to make sure that um, they have the relevant security measures in place. Um, for our lawyers, you want to make sure that your client does not represent that they will comply with PCI DSS standards if they don't have evidence of compliance. Um, also, it's renewable every year. So please confirm it's valid um, before they make any representations or warranties um, that you know, they're compliant. And if they are not PCI DSS compliant, um, you know, sorry for stating the obvious, uh, then they should not be collecting any cardholders data and they should leave that to a FinTech that has the relevant controls in place. So on the next slide, I've pulled up some of your favorite service providers. Um, <laughs> so if you have, um, any trust issues, if you're you know, concerned about who's going to be using your cardholders data, uh, who's going to be processing your cardholder um, data from now on. Um, these are some of the brands you may know and recognize um, and they are P PCI DSS compliant. So you know that you're safe if they're collecting your card details um, as part of a payment. And just a fun fact, for some of our shoppers. Um, Visa has a global register of service providers that are PCI DSS compliant. So you can search their registry online for free if you want to confirm that you're making a payment through a secure platform. But just a disclaimer, um, registering with Visa isn't compulsory. So for, for service providers. So you might not see all service providers up here, uh, but it's just, it's just an option um, in case you're looking. Yeah. Now, um, it's important to understand that, you know, there are a lot of operations relating to card payments that are shaped by card scheme rules. So card scheme rules are issued by card networks and you know they make very good nighttime reading they can be up to 869 pages or more not that anyone's counting but basically the rules are very you know are a very important aspect of any partnership involving the use of cards so i've listed some key points here that um you know any anyone involved in um a card payment partnership should be aware of. So the card scheme rules do set out standards that merchants are expected to meet before they can have access to um, the network's card payment channel through an acquirer. So insofar as you're a business and you approach a payment service provider to facilitate payments for you, so basically like anyone signing up to use Paystack um, is technically subject to card, pay, card scheme rules. Um, so, you know, there are a few non-negotiable T's and C's that, you know, should be in a merchant service agreement between the merchant and the acquirer or, you know, the merchant and the payment facilitator. Um, and these are provided in card scheme rules. Um, and, you know, it covers um, a few things, even, even termination. So if, you know, there are any issues with non-compliance, a card network can actually impose pretty um, heavy penalties and also restrict access to their network. So it's not something to take lightly if you want your business to have access um, to some of the best payment channels. And, you know, for lawyers, if you're reviewing a merchant service agreement for your client, you will want to ensure that the terms of the agreement align with the card scheme rules. You know, if the intention is for the merchant to receive card payments. There are also risk categories, um, merchant risk categories and MCCs that are part of the card scheme rules. Um, and MC a MCC, <laughs> means merchant's code category. And acquirers 
are expected to assign a MCC to a merchant based on their line of business. So MCCs are determined by card scheme rules and you know, they're updated in you know, this very chunky classification directory. So if a merchant's line of business changes, then a new MCC must be assigned to that merchant. So certain MCCs are associated with high risk businesses such as online betting or gambling. So, you know, when a merchant falls under a high risk MCC, an acquirer tends to be quite strict about their onboarding um, and also monitoring um, their transactions. So, I mean, why are they like, why are, you know, online betting merchants considered high risk? Because transactions on these platforms are more likely to lead to disputes. Um, disputes in this sense, you know, means a complaint that could be logged by a customer for value that they have not received if you know they didn't get the, if they didn't receive any winnings for their bets for example or their fraud could be used um, for fraudulent purposes and the payout on betting companies is usually like the payout to a beneficiary is usually instant so the fraud occurs very quickly and it becomes you know, the longer you leave it, the harder um, it becomes to kind of like trace, um, trace the funds. So card networks and acquirers would rather prevent the risk altogether, if possible, you know, than have to foot the bill for um, fraud. Audit rights. <laughs> um, networks do have, um, you know, networks do have audit rights. So if you're a payment facilitator or if you're an acquirer, um, having access to certain payment channels means you could be subject to an on-site audit by a card network to ensure that you're complying with their rules. And, you know, it's, um, yeah, you know, there could be a remediation plan. They could impose, you know, certain penalties or they, yeah, they could have, Kind of like key takeaways um, for you to digest, um, but it is it is a possibility. There's also transaction to fraud ratio that has to be considered. So the network, the card network, is also going to be monitoring um, the fraud that occurs through a particular um, on, a, on a on a particular acquirer's platform, or on a payment facilitator's platform. You know, so they can send warnings um, and they can send prompts, you know, to the parties involved to, you know, quickly remediate the situation. Otherwise, their access to that channel could be restricted or they could be fined. Okay. Excuse the red lines. Right. Um, so all in all, you know, we've seen the impact that fintech has had on the continent. Innovation has been you know, a commonly used word over the last decade or so. We've seen, we've also seen regulators make the most of um, you know, innovation uh, for the sake of financial inclusion. But with all of this, with the growth of financial um, technology, there has been, I, I believe there have been, you know, like unprecedented numbers and, you know, there have been, there's been exponential growth that maybe not everybody um, could have anticipated. So today, one payment solution service provider, you know, could be moving m more money digitally in one month um, than, you know, what was being done in a year for the whole of Nigeria, like a decade ago. So when considering the significant sums that are moving through platforms nowadays, it's, un it's understandable that we've seen regulators closely monitor fintechs and try and bring regulations up to speed. So we've seen, um, you know, I think three, um, yeah, we've observed kind of like three things. One is the issuing, you know, issuing of new regulations um, or amend, amending and revising existing regulations. And these, you know, this has been happening quite quickly, especially with um, 
especially with the CBN this year, I've listed um, the revised guidelines for licensing um, payment service banks. Um, there was a revised version that came out in August. Um, the exposure draft for regulatory sandbox operations that came out in June. CBN's um, guidelines on the operations of electronic payment channels. There was a 2014 version um, and minor updates were made um, in June. Now, with, you know, with all of these, um, with all of these regulations being revised and amended and being issued, it's obvious that the regulators have their mind on fintech, um, and they do have the intention to like monitor, um, you know, the growth that's taking place and make sure like all of the right checks and balances are in place. Um, in addition to, you know, issuing new regulations, we've also seen um, the increase of share capital requirements. So the CBN's exposure draft for PSSP license caring, um, that was, an, it, it's a 2018 exposure draft. It hasn't come into effect yet, um, but based on the license tiers that we can see in the draft, it's obvious that, you know, <laughs> levels are changing. Um, there is going to be um, quite, um, you know, it's, it's almost like you really have to kind of prove um, that, you're you're in it um, for the long for the long haul. It's not a small amount of money. Um, it's going to, um, I guess, to argue. Yeah, it's going to cut out a lot of um, smaller businesses from you know having an opportunity to play in this market. Um, so it's you know there are pros and cons to that, um, and there have been a lot of arguments about um, how it's stifling innovation, how it's preventing how it's preventing new companies from coming into the market, et cetera. In addition to, you know, amendments and new regulations and also the, you know, share capital requirements changing, we've also seen local equity requirements from, you know, Kenya's national ICT policy and also the Bank of Ghana's Payment Systems and Services Act um, that was assented and it came into law last year. We've um, seen how regulators are leaning more towards having um, a portion of equity um, being assigned to a citizen in that jurisdiction, um, either like a, a wholly owned um, Ghanaian company or a Ghanaian citizen um, and, you know, just trying to protect the best interests of, you know, their, their, the assets in um, that jurisdiction. Kenya's ICT policy, um, we're still waiting for, you know, like a, a roadmap and a more fleshed out like licensing framework, but the, they came out um, with very similar intentions um, to impose a 30% local equity requirement on new um, new and existing um, technology companies. So, you know, initially it could be misinterpreted to apply um, only to communications. Um, so like broadband, um, internet providers, etc. But it's actually, um, it, it, it's likely that it might affect um, fintech companies as well. But, you know, this is still subject to confirmation from um, the relevant regulators, like, you know, the Central Bank of Kenya and, um, you know, the relevant ministries. So, yes, all in all, um, this is, yeah, I'm, I've just tried to take everybody through um, what would be expected of a fintech in certain industries and in certain services. Um, we, we, we definitely do have to go through significant checks and balances. Um, I hope this um, has provided and shed more light on the fact that it's not just about, um, you know, fintechs and regulators, but there are other aspects to consider as well. Um, you know, there's um, PCI DSS, there's card scheme rules, relationships with acquirers, etc., cetera, um, various levels of accountability. Um, so I hope that um, 
people are a little bit more prepared if they didn't know this already <laughs> and they were considering um, entering into the payment space. But um, I hope this was helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Naomi. It was very helpful. Um, coming from a legal background, I definitely learned a lot about fintech. Thank you so much. We have a number of questions for you. Um, so first thing I'd have to ask is, are you willing for us to, to share some of these questions you may not answer today uh, via email and then we share the, the, your, your responses with the participants? Yes, please. That would be perfect. Okay, all right, perfect. But uh, so can I ask just three questions that I have bundled up from some of the questions that um, we got from the participants? Yes. One, one of the questions was, could you explain using examples, the role of the acquirer and the processor and the distinctions between the two? Hmm. Okay, the acquirer in this instance, okay, so let's, let me try and delineate the roles between like having an acquirer as a bank. So an acquirer as a bank has the relevant um, levels of like checks and balances in place. They're actually authorized um, by um, the relevant regulatory institutions um, and they can also be authorized by card networks to specifically act as an acquirer. So funds will be pulled by an acquirer and they would have the right to hold onto those funds in a settlement account for um, you know, a certain period of time subject to you know, whatever local regulations um, they need to comply with before settling the merchant. So that pooling of funds gives the acquirer access to a significant amount of money in, and it's all, it's all being housed in a settlement account. So that is basic. So you have, so kind of like an acquirer um, should kind of be thought of as a, um, like the bank that can, the bank that, that has the ability to house that kind of money. And, you know, no one is worrying about whether they're going to go down overnight. <laughs> um, the processor has the ability to apply for an acquiring license. So they have the right and they have the ability to be able to act as an acquirer, but just because they're a processor, it doesn't um, automatically make them an acquirer. So a processor in this scenario would be like a payment solution service provider, um, for instance, who is able to facilitate um, the transmission of data between various parties to ensure that the transaction goes through successfully or can transmit the message to confirm whether the transaction was rejected and the reason for the transaction being rejected. Um, I hope that helps. Uh, thank you, it, it does clear up things for me. Uh, thank you for that. Um, another question, and I, I've broken them up into three parts. It's regarding, <laughs> <Okay. laughs> uh, there were actually a, a few questions that I put together, but it's regarding um, credit ratings. So first and foremost, ha um, when it comes to credit ratings in the fintech space, do you follow the traditional rules of credit worthiness or uh, assessing whether someone is worthy of getting credit? And if you don't, has fintech improved this process? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I, I would say fintech has improved the process to the extent that it's easier for the customer to be, you know, to have access to loans. Um, whereas, you know, traditional banking methods would require, you know, first you have to organize a meeting with your bank. You have to like state your case, explain why you need the funds. Um, is collateral going to be involved, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whereas in this in this scenario, like fintechs um, have helped make the process a lot, like significantly faster. Um, to be very honest with you, I would need to look further into like what the process looks like for them and how they assess credit worthiness. Um, I'm aware that they carry out um, a certain degree of, you know, know your customer. So as insofar as, 
the person you know checks out they're not on like the bvn watch list they're not blacklisted um you know by um, a bank um for any particular reason um they yeah like they, they check out for all intents and purposes and you know the the lending app has also designed their own algorithm to be able to assess um whether this is someone that they want um you know, to be able to provide a loan to, um, and it's a low risk, you know, there's like a low risk possibility um, that it, yeah, there's a low risk possibility that, you know, they, they're going to run off with the funds. Um, then, yes, I, be, I believe that that does make it simpler. Um, it's down to like data, it's down to algorithm, it's KYC that takes place, um, you know, you, through like the user interface on on the app um so it's not as strenuous for the customers anymore um to have to like justify um you know why they should get a loan okay and um, that is perfectly understandable there, there are also certain issues are around certain biases i'm sure that may come up but i'll, I'll leave that for another day the follow-up question is, um, how is reckless lending addressed then? Well, from conversations that I've had with, um, you know, some loan companies, I believe that they have to just weigh, they have to weigh up the risks. Um, I don't believe that, um, I don't believe that like micro lending doesn't come with its risks. Um, I think you have, I, I think being in the fintech space, you see there's a different um, approach um, to these products and to these services. Um, it's not, you know, it's not like caution is gone with the wind, but they definitely are more willing to take risks um, when it comes to um, yeah, when it when it comes to funds, um, I'm 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 trying to not, <laughs> um, I'm I'm hesitating about how to explain this because I don't want to make any lending companies seem um, negligent. Um, but you know, from conversations that I've had with them, you know, they understand the risks. Um, that's that's ultimately the case. Um, they, you know, if you see the interest that they're charging on some of these loans, um, you know, they make their money back. Um, but for the few that they might not be able to um, collect repayments for, um, I, I believe that they have, you know, debt collectors. Um, I believe that, you know, there's a way in which they'd be able to figure out how it could balance in their books. And yeah, um, they're willing to kind of take the risk that a few, um, like a certain percentage don't end up repaying. Okay. All right. I have, I have understood your response. Um, okay. Let's go to cryptocurrency. How is cryptocurrency regulated uh, in Africa? You can use Nigeria as a case study. And while on Ni Nigeria, uh, do you think um, people will con consider using cryptocurrency? Um, I think people already are using cryptocurrency. So, is the question more like, uh, will it be used as legal um, tender? Uh, will it be considered like um, a legitimate currency in the country? I doubt that will be the case. Um, it's just too, it's too high risk um, at this stage. I don't think that, um, I, I think we are all still trying to understand it. I think the regulators are still trying to understand it. Um, and right now it's very much a, um, you know, approach with caution attitude um but i i definitely think that we will see more players in the market using um crypt using their cryptocurrency platform to extend their services um for other purposes um so you know perhaps there might be a way to integrate cryptocurrency as like a payment method um for other you know for for other payment providers like PSSPs, um, it's it's feasible, but I think everyone is kind of erring on the side of caution. Um, in so far, if they're like a licensed institution, um, they might want to wait for a sex, um, you know, more robust licensing framework to come out first. 
Um, but in the meantime, you know, people are using it. Um, there are users and, you know, they, yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> they're able to take advantage of it. Um, and it's been, it seems to be fine so far. Um, and I know some players in the market like um, buy coins have certain checks and balances in place. Um, you know, they've been able to explain how they try and manage their own risks. Um, so they carry out like KYC, they do their own risk analysis of the customer, sorry, the user on their platform. Um, you know, they don't just onboard um, anybody. So yeah, it is being used. Um, I, yeah, I can only speak to Nigeria. Um, I'm not too sure about um, what the rest of Africa looks like um, in terms of regulators being comfortable with cryptocurrency just yet. Okay, thank you. Um, Mubarak would like to know, what is the procedure of obtaining PSSP licenses in Nigeria? I can send him the licensing framework. Okay, okay, he, he should shoot me an email. I can send it to him. <laughs> okay, Mubarak, please do send her an email and she will definitely respond. Uh, Jeff would like to know, who re regulates exchanges of cryptocurrencies in Nigeria? Is it the SEC? Well, the SEC has kind of um, indicated that they're laying claim to it. Um, there, what, there isn't an existing licensing framework. Um, the first time, you know, a regulator really spoke up about it confidently was um, in the, 2009, the, the SEC's um, 2019 white paper. So it's a relatively new um, stance. Um, but yeah, they've, you know, they've made... Yeah, they, they've kind of indicated that it should be regulated. You know, they want to regulate it, but it's still not going to be like there's no sign that it's going to be recognized as like legal tender. But yeah, it's SEC from the looks of things. <laughs> OK, perfect. Um, we have gone over time by 10 minutes, so I just want to thank everyone for your patience. I want to thank Naomi for for coming on here and for um, and for, and for giving us, you know, so, so much information with regards to FinTech. And I also want to thank Michael. I know he's now offline, but uh, thank you so much for the time. I have definitely learned quite a lot and I'm sure that the, the participants have learned a lot as well. As I said earlier, um, I have captured all the questions that were in the Q&A session. Um, and if you have any other questions, please definitely email them to, to us at uh, ILCA. And once you have emailed them, the, em the email address is um, info at ILCA dot, I will check for you. Let me check, for, I'll tell you right at the end. But please do send us any other follow-up questions that you have. Uh, we will be sharing the slides from Naomi and Michael, and we will be asking you to just pop us some questions and we'll share those questions to either Michael and Naomi, depending on who you're asking the question to. And once they have responded to the questions, we will circulate.